Welcome back to L'Chaim. We're with Professor Alan Dershowitz. Professor, again, thank you very much you. for being with us. Uh, recently, uh, the United States signed a uh, $60 billion uh, military deal with Saudi Arabia. What impact does that have in the Middle East? Well, the reason they signed the deal with Saudi Arabia is because Saudi Arabia was fearful of Iranian uh, nuclear bombs. So instead of threatening Iran, uh, what they did is try to build up Saudi Arabia. It won't work. It will cause the greatest arms race in history. It will end any kind of nuclear proliferation, and it will uh, put Obama in a situation where he'll be remembered, much like Neville Chamberlain was remembered, as very good on domestic issues, but failing to confront the greatest evil of his time, which is Iran today. And we also have uh, Lebanon as well, using uh, potentially of, of using military, uh, U.S. military equipment against Israel I as well. And you speak often of uh, proportionality in terms of what Israel's response has been in the past. When is it okay for Israel to be disproportionate? Well, uh, a country should always be disproportionate against its military enemies. That is, uh, you should try to totally destroy the military that's threatening you. Uh, but always proportionate in uh, collateral damage and civilian casualties. The problem with Lebanon is up until now, Israel has not been at war with Lebanon, it's been at war with Hezbollah. Now that Hezbollah has taken over Lebanon, if Hezbollah attacks Israel, Israel is at war with Lebanon. It then becomes perfectly appropriate and proportionate for Israel to destroy Lebanon's infrastructure uh, without endangering civilian life. Uh, because it would be then a war between countries rather than a war between Israel and an organization, a militia like Hezbollah. So Lebanon ought to, ought to be very careful about allowing Hezbollah to provoke Israel, because if it does so next time, it will be a war between nations. Mm -hmm. Getting back to uh, the goal of what you're talking about uh, a lot lately is getting our kids, our Jewish youth, to uh, focus on their support of Israel. Right. Well, one of the reasons I wrote a novel recently called The Trials of Zion is because I'm a teacher, and I teach in the classroom, I teach in the courtroom, I teach in television interviews, and I teach through my books. And The Trials of Zion is an accessible book for young people. It's about young people. It's about a young woman who uh, just graduates law school and goes off to be a human rights uh, advocate in the Palestinian uh, territories and then falls in love with a young Arab man, gets in serious trouble, uh, gets kidnapped, uh, terrorist plots, uh, Iran figures into it, uh, Hezbollah and Hamas figure into it. It's a very realistic account of what's going on in the Middle East, and its purpose is to help inform through fiction uh, readers who won't read my nonfiction and who generally don't read uh, history and uh, political science books. So when I was a kid, and uh, the pride that we had in, in Israel and all it's accomplished and its ability to fight the fight in uh, the Six Day War in 73 and, and so forth, uh, that doesn't seem to exist today. No, and one of the reasons I wrote The Trials of Zion is when I was growing up, there was Exodus, the book Exodus by Leon Uris. Everybody read it mm -hmm. and everybody had pride instilled in them. I've tried to, re to write a book that is a current version of that. You know, I'm, no, I'm not Leon Uris, and my book isn't as good as Exodus. I won't claim that. But so far, the reviews have been very good. And uh, it will help students and young people and people of all ages understand the conflict better. So how can we get uh, the Jewish youth more supportive and prideful for Israel? Well, one thing is to send them to Israel uh, on trips. So at Harvard Law School, we send students of all backgrounds, Jewish and non-Jewish, to Israel during the spring break. Um, we try to do it uh, through other groups as well. Go to Israel and you will be transformed and you will understand uh, what a wonderful country it is, that it's contributed more to the world in 62 years than any other country in modern history. I know, uh, you know you speak also of uh, getting Jewish youth to feel that being prideful about Israel is cool. It's cool. It's cool. It should be. Israel's a great country. It's environmentally sensitive. It's a country that uh, is gender uh, equal. It's a country that doesn't discriminate against gays. It's a country that has freedom of religion and freedom of speech. It's a country that has everything that young people should find cool. What's next for you? Who knows? Um, writing more books, and I'm actually trying to write an autobiography called Alan Dershowitz Takes the Stand, in which I talk about my background and my history. I'm also writing other things and litigating some cases and teaching and 
down in Florida enjoying the sun. Very good. What would you like your legacy to be? I tried as hard as I could, and maybe I influenced some people. Um, I think my legacy will be as a teacher, and that's it's a great legacy because it really does continue from generation to generation. My students teach other students, and uh, it continues. A teacher never dies if he's a good teacher because his work continues. Very good. When you speak of uh, you know, a settlement and what, what could bring peace uh, to the, the Middle East, uh, do you believe that Jerusalem should be divided? I believe that Israel should have Jerusalem as its eternal uh, capital, but I think that Arab uh, sections, that have completely Arab sections of uh, East Jerusalem, uh, should be under Arab control. I hope it doesn't have to require division, but uh, I think most Israelis don't want to control large Arab population centers, um, and I think most Arabs don't want to be under the control of uh, Israel. Um, that's their choice. I mean, Arab Israelis, of course, almost unanimously want to live in Israel. They don't want to become part of a Palestinian state. Jerusalem can be solved, and um, the bigger problem is going to be how to protect Israel's security. Are you optimistic for peace? I'm cautiously optimistic. Uh, it's in the interest of both sides. Professor Dershowitz, thank you very, very much for your time oh, today on L'Chaim. Thank you. I enjoyed the interview. Thank you. With us today on L'Chaim, we're honored to have Professor Alan Dershowitz. Professor, thank you very much for joining us My pleasure, today. thank you. Um, Professor, I wanted to talk about, you know, over the past couple of years, you've been a, a, an Israel supporter your whole life, but over the past couple of years, there seemed to be uh, your, your promotion of a case uh, for Israel, a case against Israel's enemies, and now a case for Jewish support, uh, young Jewish support for Israel. Why so passionate? Well, because I think the enemies of Israel are upping the ante and ratcheting up their arguments, calling for the end of Israel, delegitimation of Israel, and it's having an effect on our young uh, people, on some of them, uh, who are ashamed uh, to be supportive of Israel. Uh, when I was growing up, everybody was proud to support Israel. Today, it's not the same because I think many of the young people don't have the education, they don't have long memories, they don't remember the struggles that Israel has gone through and efforts it has made toward peace. And so we have to increase our, our, our advocacy. Are there are cases also, the fact that uh, Jews, I think, certainly uh, assimilate more than uh, other cultures and the dominance of uh, the Arab and Muslim world that is uh, contributing to this effect? Well, Jewish assimilation has been a problem since the beginning of uh, any kind of enlightenment. Um, and the only answer to that is to make Judaism so attractive that people want to remain uh, within the Jewish culture and with Jewish values. Um, the issue of Israel is related to the issue of assimilation, but uh, there are many Jews who are committed Jews who are still embarrassed about supporting Israel and largely it's for lack of information and uh, for lack of a historical context. What's happening on our college campuses today? Some good and some bad. Some very good things are happening. A lot of students are very active on behalf of Israel. There's some great organizations that stand up for Israel on college campuses. Um, the uh, bad is that the professors for the most part are cowards and they, even the ones who support Israel won't speak out on behalf of Israel because they don't want to endanger their popularity and get involved in controversial causes. On too many college campuses, propaganda has replaced teaching, particularly in Middle East studies departments where the students don't learn anything about the truth. They only learn one-sided propaganda views uh, demonizing Israel, and that has to stop. And I know you speak candid candidly about uh, what you feel is the, the, the delegitimization legitimization of Israel on college campuses. There are efforts to try to argue that Israel has no right to exist, even though Israel is the most legitimate country in the world in the sense that it was born in law, it was born through UN resolutions, it has acted legally from the beginning of time, it has the best legal system in the world, and yet it's the only country whose uh, legitimacy is questioned by some in the international community, and that fight has to be fought very vigorously. 
Is the current administration contributing to that? No, I don't think so. I think the current administration has a balanced view toward Israel. I wish it were more supportive in some respects. I wish it had a stronger policy toward Iran, but it doesn't contribute to delegitimation. It supports Israel's right to exist as the nation state of the Jewish people. It supports a two-state solution. So I can't blame it at all. In fact, quite the opposite. I think having a liberal uh, African-American young president who supports Israel is probably a good thing for college campuses. Don't you, don't you think that he's created some doubt among the administration's support for Israel? No, I don't think so. I think he has created doubt about whether he is passionate about Israel the way Clinton was passionate and the way George W. Bush was passionate, um, but not about his general support. When he went to stay wrote and said, if people were firing rockets at my daughters, I'd do everything in my power to stop them, and I think Israel should, uh, and will do the same thing. That was a strong statement of support for Israel. Uh, if he does do the right thing on Iran and does do the right thing in terms of uh, the United Nations, I think he could be uh, a strong force for peace in Israel. Recently, uh, you wrote a piece that was uh, published in the Wall Street Journal that talked about uh, the UN Security Council. Um, trying to delegitimize uh, Israel as well. Uh, well, it was a one-sided resolution that condemned only Israel and didn't uh, in any way talk about the role that uh, others have played in the conflict in the Middle East. And uh, the United States has historically vetoed such resolutions. Jimmy Carter did not when he was the president. And the hope is that this administration will continue to use the veto power in support of fairness, equality, and uh, 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 efforts to make peace. Uh, this resolution and others don't help to make peace. So why does the, the rest of the world fall in line behind the Palestinian cause? A lot of reasons. Uh, number one, oil. Um, oil is on the side of the Palestinians. Uh, uh, number two, the hard left supports the, the Palestinians. Um, and they have been very effective in presenting their case in many respects more effective than the pro-Israel groups have been, and that has to change. What is the greatest threat to Israel today? Well, the greatest threat is Iran, a nuclear threat, because that's one that is hard to control rationally when you have an Islamicist regime willing to sacrifice 20 million Muslims to kill 5 million Jews, as Rafsanjani once put it in an interview, um, that's the greatest threat that Israel faces. Also Hezbollah, which is an Iranian surrogate, and Hamas, which is now an Iranian surrogate as well. Lebanon is now being taken over by Hezbollah and Iran. So that's the greatest threat, the crescent, the radical crescent that surrounds Israel, starting with Iran, moving toward the radical um, in Iraq, and then Syria, then Lebanon, and then uh, Gaza. Those are existential threats. Uh, the threat of delegitimation is also a very serious one. It, it appears, I think, to the general public that a lot of uh, what Iran, Iran's nuclear program is being hidden. It's being, under the, it's being put under the carpet. So the publicity that has uh, not been there over the past uh, few months is making it go away within the press, in the media. Well, I think uh, Israel has made a mistake in that respect. Uh, Dagan, the former head of the Israeli Mossad, announced, don't worry, uh, Iran won't be able to develop nuclear weapons until 2015. A, he's probably wrong, and B, he should have kept his mouth shut. Uh, this is not something you talk about in public. The pressure has to be kept on Iran. The new head of the Mossad said it's possible Iran will have nuclear weapons in two years. Uh, they may have figured out a solution to the uh, computer worm. Um, so the pressure has to be kept on. If Iran develops nuclear weapons, it will be a game changer and make peace virtually impossible in the Middle East. So what else should be done? What, when, do, when does military action uh, enter into the picture? The United States should never take the military option off the table. Uh, I hope it doesn't have to be used. Nobody wants war. Uh, but neither Israel nor the United States should take the military option off the table. George Washington in his second inaugural address said the best way to prevent war is to always be prepared for it. Many of your critics refer to Israel as an apartheid state. It's both ignorant and bigoted. Um, I fought against apartheid. I was one of Nelson Mandela's lawyers. I know what apartheid is. Uh, in Israel, uh, Arabs and Jews go to university together. Arabs serve on the Supreme Court. The court that convicted the president of Israel of rape included an Arab and two women. What other country would allow 
a president of its country to be tried by a member of a group that is generally perceived as in opposition uh, to it. Uh, Israel is the furthest thing from an apartheid state imaginable. Uh, it's a, a state which has more ethnicities and more races and more religions than virtually any country, and they live generally in harmony. We'll be back to talk more. We'll be right back.